Everybody. Good morning, and to those that are already online, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are around the world. Yeah, good night. No, not good night, that's goodbye. Uh, yeah, so welcome, as we have already had a beautiful morning together uh, with Adrian presenting, and as we uh, move into our next section with uh, Brother Lester presenting, we know that we're going to continue to be blessed. Uh, yeah, so as we begin... This, uh, the next section, we will start with, it was number 75, is that what somebody mentioned? I think. Sounds good. I thought I heard somebody yeah. mention that song. 75. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> okay. Old or new? I, I, just walk, I just walked up here. Yeah. And got Old or new? Um, that would be new. Sorry. New? Yeah. That's an awesome song. <laughs> I need to get my book. I just floated in and was in... Yeah, okay. You got the job. <laughs> got the job. I don't have a hymnal, I don't have a Bible, I don't have anything here, so we, we, we don't want to... Ah, uh, beautiful, thank you. 75, the wonder of it all. 75 in the new, the wonder of it all. It won't be up there, so I'll just leave it on main. All right. There's the wonder of sunset and evening. The wonder of sunrise I see But the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul Is the wonder that God loves me Oh, the wonder of it all The wonder of it all Just to think that God loves me. Oh, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all, just to think that God loves me. There's the wonder of springtime and harvest, the sky, the stars, soul is the wonder that's only begun. Oh, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all, just to think that God loves me. Oh, the wonder of it all, Lorraine, 595 in the old, please. 595 in the old. Hello, Lorraine. <coughs> song reminds me a couple of weeks ago, I was at Burpengary Church, and in our Sabbath school, we were just talking about the lesson, and I put forward the view that God is not a destroyer, and He's not waiting to destroy us. And after the Sabbath school, a man came to me and said, that was so wonderful, it helped me so much. Amen. Amen. And he broke down, he said, all I want to know is that God loves me. Amen. 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 Beautiful, Lester. Thank you. So, what number was it in this one? Uh, three, one, two in the new, and five, nine, five in the old. Yeah.
group here this morning. Amen. We're quite surprised, pleasantly surprised to see new faces and people I've not seen before. And just wonderful to have a, a group of people coming together and learning more about our Father in Heaven. Uh, following Adrian's uh, enlightening presentation, uh, I won't be anywhere near that exciting, I can tell you, but we're getting a lot of people join us who are new. They may still have questions about some of the basics that we've been learning for quite some time. And recently, a, a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, a friend of mine, who's writing a paper for his masters about the sonship of Christ, asked me to provide him with um, reasons why, I, or what I think begotten means and what that has in relation to Jesus. So when I was invited to present today, I thought that might be a good one to give to people who are still new to it, our message. So... Let's start by asking our Father in Heaven to be with us. Our Father in Heaven, it's just such a great joy to be here together on a Sabbath morning on a beautiful day in Brisbane with all the people who come to join us today to receive your spirit, with all the people who are online who get up early in the morning like Brother Bright to hear the words that you would speak pray that you would be with us uh, as I speak and that the little message that you've given me to share will be a blessing to those about or who hear it. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm not very good with PowerPoint and sort of coordinating it, so just bear with me as we go along. 
Who, as I said, my dear friend, the Adventist pastor, is, is writing a paper um, and I asked him what his motivation was and to whose glory he was writing it because the position is that Jesus is the Son of God as a result of the Incarnation, but that doesn't take away from him being God in all eternity. And so I thought I would do some research because we all have an understanding, but as we dig into God's Word, we find more and more information that we hadn't seen before. And you're like, oh, go, oh, wow. So what does it mean when talking of Jesus Christ being begotten? And we can't just guess. The Bible has to explain itself. Some of us are familiar with uh, William Miller's rules, and I've just put two of them up. But from the Review and Herald in November 9, uh, 25 of 1884, Mrs White writes, Those who are engaged in proclaiming the third angel's message are searching the scriptures upon the same plan that Father Miller adopted. Are we engaged in proclaiming the third angel's message? Yes. It's the message for today, followed up, of course, by the fourth angel of Revelation 18. But the three angels' message is what the Adventist church was raised up to proclaim. And she doesn't say those who are engaged, or some of those who are engaged, or a few of those who are engaged. She says those who are engaged. This encompasses all who would be engaged in proclaiming the third angels' message. And I've highlighted the two that are important today, that scripture must be its own expositor, since it is a rule of itself. If I depend on a teacher to expound to me and he should guess at its meaning or desire to have it so on account of his sectarian creed or to be thought wise, then his guessing, desire, creed or wisdom is my rule and not the Bible. And I've added one that's not in, in the Review and Herald, but it's in the list of uh, William Miller's rules. It's how to know when a word is used figuratively. If it makes good sense as it stands and does no violence to the simple laws of nature, then it must be understood literally, not figuratively. So if we go to uh, John 3.16 to 18, I just have to look up and make sure I'm coordinated. Yeah. Okay. Hmm? No, no, I, I have to look up the yeah, OPT. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him. Who is the him? Christ. The son. The son. I ask most people and they say God. But the text says, if we're reading it literally, for God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in his only begotten son should not perish but have everlasting life. And reading that text, just as it's written, is there any reason that we shouldn't understand that Jesus is literally the only begotten Son of God? Does it appear symbolic? Does no. it do violence to the simple laws of nature? So let's take a look. The question, the issue at question is begotten or only begotten. As the text stands, it suggests that God actually has a son, that he has begotten. And is that the case? The Greek word used here is monogenes, and it appears to be derived from two words, mono being sole, single or only, and genomai, which has many meanings, one of which is to cause to be or to generate. There is divided opinion over whether God actually has a begotten son and when he begot that son. We are told by people who have a different point of view that monogenes means unique. And I think that's actually true. Jesus is unique. And the reason he's unique is because he is 
the only begotten <laughs> Son of God. Let's look at uh, Genesis 5, 3, and I don't have a slide for it, it's very short. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son, and the words a son are supplied, and begat in his own likeness after his own image and called his name Seth. The Hebrew word for begat is yalad and means to bear young. Nobody seems to have any problem believing that Adam was the father of Seth and that begat in that context means to produce or bring forth a son. The Greek word used here in the Septuagint is genio and it means to procreate properly of the father, beget, be born, bring forth and clearly is translated as meaning that Adam is the literal father of Seth. We would say that Seth is the begotten son of Adam. And I don't think anyone would argue with that. Returning to John 3.16, in most modern versions of the Bible, begotten is omitted. So in the English Standard Version and others, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him. And in the TLV, and I can't remember what that is, but it's a modern version. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. <coughs> now both of those are true. They're actually correct translations, but they are missing the key word of begotten. Now, we've talked about contradiction if we come to a conclusion that has contradiction then we can't have the truth because we can only have the truth when we reach a conclusion that has no contradiction the contradiction that i see when we talk about god's only son or one and only son is god actually has many sons many sons throughout the universe the sons of god sang when the earth was created adam according to the Bible, was a son of God. So to say that Jesus is God's only son contradicts that God has many sons. Now, admittedly, all of other God's other sons are created sons, but the word created doesn't affect the fact that they are considered to be sons of God. Uh, I don't believe that Jesus Christ was created, and I think most Christians would agree with that. So why does Jesus, who is the one speaking in John 3.16, why does Jesus differentiate between created sons and a begotten son when referring to himself? And if Jesus is begotten, when was he begotten? So let's see who Jesus claimed to be. Many times throughout his life, Jesus refers to his father, calling him <coughs> my father. On one occasion, the Jews accused him of blasphemy because he said, I am the Son of God. In calling God his Father, Jesus was openly claiming that he is the Son of God. Again, most Christians would agree with that. How is it then that Jesus is the Son of God? It was either by being begotten, brought forth, or coming out from God, prior to anything created, or it was through the process of incarnation, because those are the only two alternatives that we have. Because if it wasn't by being begotten prior to creation, or it wasn't through the incarnation, there is no other explanation for Jesus, or no justification for Jesus being called the Son of God. So the question is, is then, when, when did Jesus become the Son of God? Was it before anything was created, or was it in the incarnation? All who believe that Jesus is the Son of God believe one of these two positions, but only one of them can be truth because they are actually diametrically opposed to each other. What is the evidence for each position? Almost all of the Christian world believes in the Trinity. In this understanding of God, he is a unity of three co-eternal persons, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. None of the persons is really a father. None is really a son, because they are all co-eternal and co-equal. The terms Father, Son and Holy Spirit are simply names or roles assigned to each of the persons. These roles are specifically assigned and accepted for the plan of salvation. I see a contradiction with that. 
because these roles were given, assigned and accepted before the plan of salvation was devised or even needed. What would have happened if Lucifer hadn't fallen? These three beings would have been known as God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit for the purpose of the plan of salvation when there was no plan of salvation required. In this understanding of God, one of the co-eternal persons, the one with the role of God the Son, would leave heaven, come to earth as a baby human being and become the Son of God. He was not the Son of God beforehand, but he would become the Son of God. But does this actually make him a real son? I can see Adrian stunned. <laughs> does this make him a real son or is it a role that he is playing? If it does make him a real son, who is he the son of? God the Father or God the Holy Spirit? Or even his own son, making him his own father? In my understanding, the process of incarnation is similar to a IVF surgeon taking a living embryo, a combination of a male and a female, into a living cells and inserting that cell into a woman so that it can grow into a baby. So when a surgeon takes a living being, tiny as it is, and inserts it to where it can grow, does that make the surgeon the father of that child? And the answer normally would be no, unless the surgeon actually happened to be the sperm donor, in which case he would be the father of the child. So just keep that thought. So unless the one who left heaven is actually the son of God before he left heaven, the process of being incarnate does not actually make him the son of God. He can't become what he was not. Because he is a living being who was put into Mary to grow. But his identity didn't change at all. He can't go from being not a son to being a son through the process of incarnation, in my view. Especially in the way we understand begotten. So in Luke chapter 1 and verse 35, it says, And the angel answered her, the angel speaking to Mary, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. If we read this literally and believe in the Trinity, then God the Holy Spirit is the one who put the pre-existing being into Mary and that the child shall be called the Son of God. No, nope, it only says called. It doesn't say he will be the Son of God. That raises another question. But this would make God the Holy Spirit the father of the child if we understand that the process of incarnation actually makes that child a son. This raises a contradiction one of which is later on at the baptism of Jesus, a voice is heard from heaven proclaiming, this is my beloved son. Whose voice is making that claim? The Holy Spirit. It has to be because it's his son. So the voice in heaven has to be, under the Trinitarian understanding, has to be God the Father, the one playing the role of Father, because God the Holy Spirit has just come and sat on Jesus' shoulder in the form of a dove and he's not speaking so the one in heaven is saying this is my beloved son but he's actually lying he is claiming to be the father of God the Holy Spirit's son to me that's a huge contradiction it can't be true because we just read that God the Holy Spirit is the actual father of the one playing the role of the son and I use the word role playing because pastor uh, David Lawson used exactly that word in his book, Why I Am a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. It is actually the belief of most churches, and particularly the Adventist church, that um, the roles are being played by the co-eternal beings. Wow. That's, uh, Therefore, God the Father is lying about being the father of the one playing the role of the son because he doesn't really have a father at all. And if he did, it would be God the Holy Spirit. And according to Miller's rules, contradiction means that we don't have the truth. Mm -hmm. So the, the notion that 
Jesus Christ is one of three co-eternal beings playing the role of the Son of God, or at least the Son of the Father, would be a lie where there is a contradiction. In John chapter 17, verse 1, Jesus speaking again, And these words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son may glorify thee. Now, who is Jesus talking to? He calls him Father. Now, if he's not his Father, and I think we would all agree that it's God the Father that he's speaking to, but if it's not his Father, then Jesus is also lying. Because under the Trinitarian understanding, the Holy Spirit is Father. So if he's speaking to the Father in heaven and calls him Father, he's not telling us the truth. He also tells us that the person he's talking to is the only true God, and then he asks that person to glorify his Son. Who is that Son? If we read this literally, it denotes a Father and a Son relationship. For it to be truth, there must be such a relationship. If it's only role play for the plan of salvation, it is all metaphorical or a lie, but it is not truth. Now, what is it that Jesus claims makes him a son? John chapter 17, verse 7. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. So clearly he's saying that his father has given him things, and those things are of his father. And then he says, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. So Jesus has given words that he was given by his father. The men have received the words, and as a result of receiving those words, they have known surely that Jesus came out from God. And they believed it, it's that God single, did send him. It's a single point of communication, not a dualism. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good way of putting it. A single point. Jesus says all things that the one he calls Father and is the only true God has given to him. He then states that the men he is with have known that he came out from the one he calls Father. The word translated as out is exerchomai, meaning to issue or come forth or come out of or to proceed forth. The one Jesus is speaking to is his Father, the only true God. And therefore Jesus is telling us that he is the Son of God that issues forth, came forth from, or proceeded from the Father, who is the only true God. And then he says his Father sent him. So the question is, when did Jesus issue from, proceed forth, etc.? And it was when he was begotten, because that is what begotten means. So to proceed forth, to issue from, means to be begotten, to be generated. So as Seth was begotten of Adam, then Jesus was begotten of God, if we read the Bible literally. To see a little bit more clearly, we look in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through to 5. It says, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So who appointed Jesus as heir of all things? Father. His father. God, actually. God appointed him heir of all things, and he has spoken to us through his son. So clearly God has a son who he has spoken to us through and by whom also he made the worlds. We're told that God has spoken to man through his son and that God made all the worlds through his son. Now the question is, does God have a son and is that son begotten? Verse four and five, verses four and five rather tell us that the son was made better than the angels. <coughs> Sounds like he was created. The word made is genomai, which means, as it was in the case of Seth and Adam, to cause to be, generate, to come into being. And verse 5 tells us that when the Son came into being, God said to him, Thou art my Son. The two verses tell us that Jesus has a more excellent name than the angels because his name 
is by inheritance. What name does the son inherit? His father's name. So Jesus inherited the name of God. Hello, Jenny. <laughs> Which is a more excellent name than the angels. Why is the name of God more excellent than the name of the angels? Because they are created beings. Whereas Jesus is a begotten being, begotten of God, making him God's literal son by birth. Very unique. Amen. Sorry? Very unique. Unique. Very unique to be begotten of God and to inherit the name of God by being begotten. That is unique. Unless he was the only one who knew the character of God completely. Mm. Absolutely. Ex more excellent name. No man knows the Father. More excellent name. He inherited the name of God. He knew it because it was his own name. Amen. Now, some say that these verses refer to the incarnation. But is there any biblical support for this view? And the answer lies in verse 6. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. So in verses 4 and 5, there is no command for the angels to worship him. But God said to him, you are my son, this day have I begotten you. Why is this? It's because there were no angels to command when Christ was begotten. They were created. The son created them later on. The first verse goes on to say, When he bringeth the first begotten into the world, therefore the first begotten existed before he was brought into the world. Mm. And when he was brought into the world, the angels were commanded to worship him. It's interesting that the word is again and again. If you leave out what's between the commas, and again he saith, let all the angels of God worship him. So in heaven we're told that God told the angels to worship him as well. He called a conference together to explain to them the true position of his son. So again, when he brings the first begotten into the world. In verse 10 we see, And thou, Lord, this is God speaking of Christ, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, Amen. and the heavens are the work of thine hands. Amen clearly showing us that it was the first begotten that created the world, worlds, thereby showing us that the first begotten is also the Son of God, because he is begotten of God. Why is he called the first begotten? Because he is. Because he is the first being to ever have been begotten. And his being begotten preceded the creation of anything. Those who say the begotten applies to the incarnation miss the point that many beings had been begotten prior to the incarnation and therefore he could not truthfully be called the first begotten. In Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 6, As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Who said thou art a priest forever, and what does forever encompass? In verse 5, it says, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. So it was the one that said to Christ, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. It was God who said to Christ, Thou art my son, Today I have begotten thee. When did God say to Christ, say this to Christ? It can only be the day that he was begotten. Because that's what the text says. If we read it literally, that's how it should be understood. On the day that Christ was begotten, he was made a high priest forever. Who made him a high priest? His father did. His father. God made him a high priest. Who is his father? The one that said, today I have begotten thee, is his father. And God is that one. If you look in uh, John chapter 8, verse 42, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. 
neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Jesus is clearly telling the Jews that he proceeded forth and came from God, who he calls Father. The word translated as proceeded forth is our old friend Exochemai. The same word, to proceed forth, come out of. In John chapter 5 and verse 25 to 27, Jesus speaking says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Here Jesus is telling us that the only the dead that hear the voice of the Son of God shall live. It's a little bit scary if you don't believe that God has a Son. He also tells us that as the Father has life in himself, so he has given to the Son to have life in himself. When then did the Father give to the Son to have life in himself? In the when he was begotten. Thank you, Colin. When he was begotten of the Father. So did Jesus have life in himself before the incarnation? Therefore, he was given life in himself before the incarnation. He was brought forth. He came forth with life in himself. The same life that the Father has. Immortal life by inheritance. This position has no contradiction. It is not obviously symbolic and it does no violence to the simple laws of nature. I won't read this one all through. I'm sure you all know it. But Proverbs 8, 22 to 30. 30 and Jesus personified as wisdom, clearly said, when there were no depths, I was brought forth, when there were no fountains abounding with water. So he's saying prior to creation, mm -hmm. certainly the creation of this world, maybe other worlds have mountains and depths too, prior to them all, he was brought forth. So we are told that Christ, personified as wisdom, was brought forth. The question is who or what was he brought forth from? And Jesus answered that question in the previous verses. He was brought forth, begotten from God, the only true God, the source of all, the Father. Now we need a second witness as to who God is so that we can know who Jesus claims to have come out of and proceeded forth from. We all know this one very well. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verses 4 to 6. I'll just read the last verse. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things. <laughs> Here Paul tells us that there is only one God, and then he tells us who that God is, the Father. He goes on to say that all things are of the Father. In other words, the Father is the source of all things. Amen. Now, all things must be all things other than God. Paul goes on to say that there is also one Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, the one Lord Jesus Christ must be one of the all things that came from the source and that God then made all other things through Jesus Christ. This is entirely consistent with what Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 tells us. God is the source of all things. Before all things were made, he brought forth, begot his son. And through the channel of his son, he made all other things. Amen. God himself is the source of all things. And Jesus Christ is the channel through which God acts or the intermediary between God and all of creation. Amen. Jesus says in John chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh under the Father but by me. The word man is udis or udais and it means nobody, nothing, not any. He's not just talking about men, he's talking about the universe. He's talking about angels and all of creation that nobody comes to the Father but through him. He is telling us that he has always been an intermediary between all of creation and God. 
If Jesus is really the literal, only begotten Son of God, who then would benefit by convincing the world that he is not the begotten Son of God? Who did not wish to come to the Father, who is the only true God, through his Son? And the answer, of course, is Lucifer, who became lifted up by reason of his beauty and wanted to no longer be like Christ, but he wanted to be like the Most High. He wanted the position held in heaven that the Son of God held. And he wanted the honour that was accorded to the Son of God by God and all of creation. It was Lucifer who first rebelled against the true, literal, begotten sonship of Christ. And this is what started the whole controversy. Try and rip God off with lies. Fobbed it off with lies. Yeah. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 3 and in other places, it records, And when the tempter, who is Lucifer or Satan, came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made of bread. Now, Lucifer knew who Christ was in heaven. He was without excuse. Why would he come to him in the desert and say, if you really are the Son of God? Because God had turned around and said, you are my son. Just recently to that, he wanted to prove that Jesus actually believed it. He had just heard the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son. And Ellen White tells us when God said, this is in Desire of Ages, when God said, this is my beloved son. He was testifying to his divinity. He didn't say, because you are co-eternal and co-equal and co-powerful with me, you are divine. You are my beloved son, was a testifying to his divinity. So in questioning the word of God, this is my beloved son. Uh, son. Lucifer is continuing his rebellion. Satan has convinced the whole Christian world that God does not have a begotten son and that God did not send that son to the earth. He has done this by convincing us that God is a unity of three co-eternal persons and that these persons play roles. That one of these persons came to earth to pretend to be the son of God, but in reality is nobody's son at all. This is called the wine of Babylon because all nations have drunk this wine. The Bible says all nations. We know that the whole world worships the beast and worships the dragon. How does the world worship the dragon? By believing his lie that God does not have an only begotten son and is a unity of three co-eternal persons. Now Satan did not say to Jesus, if thou be the second person of the Godhead come to play the role of the son of God, if Jesus is really one of three co-eternal beings and he's only playing the role of the Son of God, why would Satan go along with that deception? Why would he actually call him, if you are the Son of God? And the answer is he wouldn't. Why does Satan want to obscure the fact that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God? And it's because of John 3.16 to 3.19... For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you believe Jesus, the name of the only begotten Son of God, if you believe Jesus is the same character as his Father and is the only begotten Son of God, you have everlasting life. And Satan does not want us to have everlasting life. It has occurred to me that the reason he doesn't want that is this world will continue. Satan will continue forever. That's why he doesn't want us to achieve everlasting life. And in John chapter 17 and verse 3, Jesus himself defines life eternal again. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. We have two witnesses telling us that everlasting life is to know the Father, who is the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom the Father has sent. And it's interesting that everlasting life and eternal life are exactly the same word. Just one place is translated as everlasting and another eternal. I guess they mean the same thing, but why the difference? 
Now the whole world believes Satan's lie. But John 3.16 to 3.19 and John 17.3 tell us what life eternal is and this is what Satan does not want us to have. So I have a slide for you. This is my paraphrasing of John 3.16 to 3.19. For God, a unity of three co-eternal persons, the Godhead, so loved the world that he gave one of the persons of himself to play the role of the son of the three co-eternal persons of the Godhead, that whosoever believeth in the person of the Godhead playing the role of the son of the three co-eternal persons of the Godhead should not perish, but have everlasting life. For the three co-eternal persons of the Godhead sent not one of the persons of the Godhead playing the role of the son of the three co-eternal persons of the Godhead into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through the person of the Godhead playing the role of the son of the three co-eternal persons of the Godhead might be saved. He that believeth on the person of the Godhead playing the role of the son of the three co-eternal persons of the Godhead is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the person of the Godhead playing the role of the son of the three co-eternal persons of the Godhead. That's really good, Les. I just have one yeah. point at the very beginning. It shouldn't say he gave, but they gave then. Mm-hmm. It should, but in the Adventist belief, mm-hmm. it says God is a unity of three co-eternal persons and he is worthy of our adoration. <laughs> So that, that is actually why I didn't say they, but that is a really good point. But I left the he in to emphasise the contradiction that it presents. That three could be called he because somebody has decided that they make up the Godhead. And there is the mystery of Babylon. Pardon? There is the mystery of Babylon. The mystery of Babylon. The, the mystery is that we would all believe the mystery. The mystery of falsehood. Now many will, many will think that's blasphemy. But I put it to you that it is not blasphemy. It is Satan's lie, which is blasphemy. (laughs) But it does reflect the understanding of the Christian world, even though probably they've never read it that way. So I believe I've shown from the Bible and the Bible alone what I understand by the word begotten in regards to Jesus Christ and his relationship with God. Um, I'm not going to go on a lot more. There are, there are more, but I'd, I'd like to read one particularly from Alan White. I've got a fair bit more and I don't really want to carry on. But it's um, um, number 27. It's interesting, Lester, even on earth while Jesus was down here, the, the spirits and the evil spirits all recognised who he was. Mm. And trembled. And trembled. I might read two more. (laughs) Sorry. This is from the Spirit of Prophecy. And it's worth reading closely, line by line. The great creator assembled the heavenly host. This is in heaven before the earth was created. That he might, in the presence of all the angels, confer special honour upon his son. Now, if he did not have a son then this is all a sham. The Son was seated on the throne with the Father, and the heavenly throng of holy angels was gathered around them. The Father then made known that it was ordained by himself that Christ, his Son, should be equal with himself, so that wherever was the presence of his Son, it was as his own presence. This explains why all through the Old Testament, Jesus is referred to as God. Because it was his presence. It's interesting, Lester, it doesn't say that Christ made it known to anyone. Prior no, to this. the Father made it known. Mm. Not him. Yeah. So he was not self-seeking at all. The source of all. Yeah. The word of the Son was to be obeyed as readily as the word of the Father. His Son he had invested with authority to command the heavenly host. Especially was his Son to work in union with himself in the anticipated creation of the earth and every living thing that should exist upon the earth. His son would carry out his will and his purposes but would do nothing of himself alone. The father's will would be fulfilled in him. And remember it says the great creator that is the father, the only true God. His son would carry out his will and his purposes, but would do nothing of himself alone. The father's will would be fulfilled in him. 
Satan was envious and jealous of Jesus Christ, yet when all the angels bowed to Jesus to acknowledge his supremacy and high authority and rightful rule, Satan bowed with them. But his heart was filled with envy and hatred. And we just learnt what envy and hatred do to people, what you want to do to people that you envy and you hate. Christ had been taken into the special counsel of God in regard to his plans while Satan was unacquainted with them. He did not understand, neither was he permitted to know the purposes of God. I'll jump ahead to a book, This Day with God. The interesting thing about this book is that it is actually a compilation. <laughs> it kind of blows me away that it's here. But Ellen White is speaking. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Angels were expelled from heaven because they would not work in harmony with God. They fell from their higher state because they wanted to be exalted. They had come to exalt themselves, and they forgot that their beauty of person and character came from the Lord Jesus Christ. This fact the fallen angels would obscure that Christ was the only begotten Son of God. And they came to consider that they were not to consult Christ. One angel began the controversy and carried it on until there was rebellion in the heavenly courts among the angels. They were lifted up because of their beauty. There is much, much more that we could present, but it all confirms and reinforces that even in heaven, before this earth was created, Lucifer had convinced people that Christ was not the only begotten Son of God. Mm -hmm. But God presented to them that Jesus was his son and he would work through his son. If Jesus is not his son prior to the incarnation, then God was lying. And we know that God cannot lie. Mm -hmm. The evidence is there for those who want to see it. Jesus inherited all things. The Bible is clear. Ellen White is clear. In the incarnation... Jesus inherited nothing that he didn't already have. He didn't change from being the Son of God and become the Son of God. He was the Son of God who came to became, oh, sorry, became to become the Son of Man. Mm -hmm. So it's up to each one of us to decide which God we will believe in. Mm -hmm. We're effectively presented with only two. There are thousands of gods out there, we all know that, but from the Bible... In the Christian world, we are presented with two gods. One who is a unity of three co-eternal persons who does not have an only begotten son, even through the incarnation. He does not have an only begotten son. He does not have a one and only son. He doesn't have a unique son. He doesn't have a son at all. He has one of himself pretending to be a son. Or we have the true God, the only true God, who Jesus calls Father, and Jesus Christ, whom the Father has sent. My prayer is that those who've heard this will seek the evidence for themselves and choose, as Elijah said, which God you will serve. Amen. Thank you very much. Praise God never changes. God never changes. No. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, Amen. and forever. His word. The Son yesterday, the Son today, Son forever. A priest yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you. Amen. Father in heaven, what a privilege it is to be able to call you Father and know that as Jesus, your only begotten Son, inherited all things from you, he gives to us his inheritance. Thank you for making it so clear from your word <clears throat> in the Holy Bible and the inspired writing of the Spirit of Prophecy through Ellen White. So clear, the evidence is so clear that Jesus is your only begotten Son, begotten prior to anything else being created and that through your Son you created all things. And then you sent your Son to this earth to show us <clears throat> the complete character of God so that we might believe. And in believing, we might have life eternal. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
that we are planning to have our camp meeting, our Tabernacles camp meeting at Paul and Dice. That'll be September 22, evening of September 22. So the good news is that the powers that be have allowed us to have up to 100 people in a facility, which is means we won't have any restrictions, unless we have more than 100, uh, which we haven't done yet. So uh, talk to Colin about uh, details. Is that right? We'll, we'll get an email out. Get an email out? Yeah, we'll draft something out for you, you guys have a look at them and send something out. All right, so we'll send something out. So we're looking forward to a, a very special camp meeting for an outpouring of the Spirit of God. And we need to pray that this 100, now the, a cap greater than 30 will apply through, because this is only until the 10th of September. Yes. Tabernacles comes up, that's when we need to pray that the door will stay open to, and, to have a... And, and why is this important? Because as Moses said to Pharaoh, if we do not keep this feast, there will be sword, famine and pestilence. So uh, we don't want that for Brisbane. It's clear from what, what you've been sharing as well that this is where we should be praying for whole, whole, whole. We know this is the beginning of the time of yeah. trouble. Yes. We're told this is when we should be praying for whole because I'm not sealed with the Father's name. So we, we need to pray for that. We need to pray for that. But that's why mm. we know we are right on the doorstep of the time of trouble. We are Amen. right on the doorstep. And to pray for our Premier, yes. not to curse her, no. but mm. pray for her and our Prime Minister, Amen. and for the police force, to pray for them, that God will speak to their hearts and, and bless them and encourage them and restrain the evil. That's what's happening. And, and, that's right, and pray for those who are seeking to rise up against this. Yes. Yes, pray for them that they will appeal in a submissive way, without demands, without threats, without force. That's what we want to pray for, for our our lovely state here in Queensland and for all of our the states and to pray for our states below us because many, many people are suffering, many people's lives are being lost, many people are taking their own lives because of the pressures that are being applied. So we need to gather together and of course September 18 we'll be meeting here uh, at this stage for the Day of Atonement, the Day of Atonement at one moment. And uh, we will be having a baptism on that day. So uh, we invite you all to come. My wife and I are going to be baptised. So into this truth, finally. So uh, invite you all to come September 18. And of course we have Feast of Tr uh, Trumpets, which is on the 8th, to announce the judgment, preparation of these things. If you're unsure about these things, we have plenty of publications that deal with these subjects. We can let you know about them. But... Many of us here have found tremendous joy in our Father's appointments. And when God says that he calls for a feast, it's not a famine, like Christianity says. It's a feast. So uh, invite you all to come. All right, to those online, God bless you. We'll catch you next time. Thank you.
eyes, no feeling tired, no sad, lonely eyes, no saying goodbye to the people that you love, no worries to tease.